session description, which I think starts adopter, convertible or skeptic, who are you when it comes to clean energy? I hope we are all adopters. We here certainly are. Uh, and I believe, especially in Nepal, it's not, they're, they're, we don't, they're not the people that fight for nuclear energy or fossil fuels. But nevertheless, we have a lot to be done because we all know the, despite all energy generated in Nepal being renewable as such already, we have, for example, a situation where the majority of the population relies on very inefficient use of firewood, which is also not clean, which damages our health and which damages the environment. So I think there is a, a lot to be done. And uh, I also personally think we all are adopters, but maybe we can even greater adopters this is also a personal choice, and uh, of course in Germany, as a German, it's even easier as a personal, as an individual to make those choices. I have made them, but even here in Nepal we can have these choices, if not only about what kind of energy do we use, but also do we use it for what do we use it? So also here in Nepal, for example, on my personal house, there are the solar panels, and this morning I chose to take the bicycle to come here. So these are choices we have, uh, and this is also maybe something to talk about. Uh, so for this, uh, now I want to give an opportunity to our uh, great uh, four panelists uh, to talk on the issue. And uh, I, basically my key question to them is rather broad. It's what is your personal vision uh, regarding mainstreaming clean energy in Nepal? And I've given them two aspects which I'm also particularly interested in. And one is, what kind of energy mix do we need in Nepal? And second, uh, how can we do it in a combined approach, combining off-grid and on-grid approaches and not always talking separate on this? So with this, I hand over first to Sujit, please. So, uh, you know, uh, Claudia just mentioned, uh, you know, uh, are we fans or foes of, you know, something like that, of clean energy? Well, in terms of Nepal, you know, clean energy is not just a choice uh, that we need to make because it's good for the environment. Clean energy is a choice for our national security. And, uh, you know, clean energy is uh, completely intertwined with our national sovereignty also. And the third thing is, you know, clean energy, the infusion of clean energy is required to ensure that we have economic development in this country. So those are very uh, broad statements, and I'm going to, you know, uh, you know uh, category, uh, you know, break it down. Uh, right now in Nepal, uh, we import around 45% uh, of our entire budget, annual budget, is spent on importing four things. One is petrol, diesel, cooking gas, petroleum products like cars and, uh, you know, uh, stuff like that. So, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, many of us, you know, that were here during the economic blockade knew what happened, you know, when those uh, products were, uh, you know, they, they couldn't come into Nepal. <coughs> so what we need to do is we need to start using the energy that is uh, available within this country to start replacing these very, very dangerous things that have already shown a very uh, terrible impact on the economy of Nepal and the sovereignty of Nepal. And the Energy Development Council, as you know, you know, we've been saying that we don't, we don't need a Nepal oil corporation. Uh, we don't need the petroleum pipeline coming from, uh, you know, uh, from India to Nepal. Uh, what we need right now is, you know, we need uh, uh, domestic generation from our uh, renewable energy sources. And, uh, you know, I just want to also share something. You know, people always ask me, why do you call yourselves the Energy Development Council? And I keep telling them, we're, we're, we're kind of delusional, you know. Because in Nepal, energy, you know, means clean energy for us. So uh, uh, right now, there are three things that we need to be doing in this country. And Energy Development Council is uh, leading that effort. And we are, we're going we're to succeed. It's just a matter of when. So the first thing is we need to convert all these, uh, uh, you know, imported cooking uh, kitchens, uh, imp uh, kitchens uh, working on imported cooking gas into the uh, electricity induction, uh, you know, based uh, infrastructure. The second thing is we need to uh, stop importing petroleum and diesel cars, which means importing more petrol and diesel from other countries, and replace that with electric vehicles. And that's going to happen. You know, we've, EDC has, uh, last year, we successfully lobbied to bring down the uh, taxes down to 10%. And it's going to come down to 1% very soon. That's number two. 
The third thing is, uh, I think about 75%, uh, as Claudia, Claudia was saying, 75% of people in this country are you know, cutting down trees uh, because you know, they need firewood and they're using kerosene. So unfortunately, you know, the, the national grid does, has not reached, I think, 40%. I'm not sure if you know, exact the numbers because you know, I'm very poor with uh, you know, being politically correct and semantics. But around 40% of Nepal today does not have a grid, uh, is not connected to the grid. Around 25% of this country's citizens don't have uh, uh, electricity, access to electricity. So one of the key things, one of the key findings you know, from this summit should be that this is a golden chance now, a golden opportunity has come to start a new utility. It's going to be called a microgrid utility. And there's no law in Nepal. Neither does our Electricity Act, you know, neither does any of our laws prevent for an electricity utility you know, to be established. I know, you know that sounds a little uh, you know, uh, off the beaten path. But if you look at our laws, you know, if you set up anything below one megawatt in Nepal, you, know, you can be your own distributor, generator, producer, you can even fix your own rates. So if we had these microgrid utilities, you know, all these places, uh, in today's current climate with, uh, you know, the prices, price of energy storage going down, you know, solar panels, uh, you know, the price is going down. Uh, just yesterday I received a proposal from State Grid of China, you know, where the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, cost of a one, uh, the cost of generation of a one megawatt microgrid is around, uh, I think it was around 10 rupees, 11 rupees. So that's, you know, you can compete, you know, with, with the uh, regular, you know, electricity that's happening, you know, that's in the grid. So our vision, you know, right now is how do we replace these cars with electric vehicles? How do we replace our, uh, you know, petrol, uh, you know, cooking gas uh, powered, fired uh, stoves with electric induction stoves? Uh, one of the other biggest problems that is never spoken about, and it is connected with clean energy, uh, the biggest cause of poverty in Nepal is the depreciation of our currency. Nepal's currency has depreciated so much in the last five years. So if you made 50% profit, and then you look at it you know, in terms of the global thing, you made nothing, you lost. So we need to find a way how we can, uh, how we can, uh, you know, uh, you know, we gotta find new solutions. You know, this pegging with the Indian rupee is not the right solution. So one of the things EDC is looking at right now is, maybe we need to adopt a cryptocurrency. Yes, and that's a very, very, uh, a bold statement to be made, but if you look at it, uh, what's the only export of Nepal? Cons the uh, substantial export of this country, it's our labor. I'm not talking about potatoes and cardamom and carpets. You know, before the blockade, uh, for every one rupee that was uh, exported, nine rupees was imported of, of goods. After the blockade, for every one rupee that was exported, 13 rupees has been you know, is, the, is our uh, imports. So what we need to do, uh, yeah, and you know, that, that export is basically labor. So these guys that are going overseas and sending their money, you know, 5% of the money, 7%, what are these, you know, these uh, uh, money changes, they're just, uh, you know, uh, uh, cutting that out. If you had blockchain uh, cryptocurrencies, what would happen is there wouldn't be these middlemen. So, you know, you'd, you'd save 5% of, you know, the, the total income coming into Nepal. And so how is... Cryptocurrencies related with uh, clean energy, because we need we can we can mine it here in this in this country. We have you know, a lot of electricity. The other thing that I also want to say is you know we've got this. It's almost I don't know if I should say this here, but you know it's almost like having a you know uh, you know you remember something from your past like an ex-lover's love. You know we have the same kind of a thing right now where we think oh you know we can export electricity to India. It's not the, uh, you know, probably, you know, right now, you know, we've got uh, some, you know, uh, you know, legal and, you know, procedural hurdles. But the cost of generation of electricity in Nepal is higher than the, you know, the cost of uh, uh, supply, in, uh, you know, in India. So you can't sell it there. So what we need to do right now, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm a very big proponent that we export electricity too, but it's not possible at this stage. What we need to do now is we need to find ways for our economy to be completely based on electricity. You know, Nepal should be an electrified economy. And uh, this electri electri electrification comes from within Nepal. So, uh, you know, I, I know I've been given five minutes, but I'm a, I'm a businessman and I always make a profit for people. So I think I'm going to save you a couple of minutes, Claudia. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sujeev, for very interesting suggestions. So I hand over directly to Ramesh. Okay, thank you, Claudia. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting Issue Mode.
to respond it. I do agree with Sujit that uh, we need to create domestic demand in Nepal. And also I do agree with him that we have to think about distribu distributed energy generation systems. But when I look at Nepal, uh, based on the past experience, right now the access to electricity in Nepal is about 85%. A few years back, about five years back, the data was 70%. Out of that, 25% came from off-grid systems. So that's more than one-third access to electricity in Nepal came from off-grid systems. So Nepal is a very it kind of a best practice as far as off-grid systems is concerned. The development of institutions like AEPC and the role of UNDP through AEDP played a very key role in the late 90s and early 2000s to create access to electricity for people in the rural areas through off-grid systems. But I agree, we need to do more. Well, as far as the role of private sector is concerned, which is another theme of interest to this topic, to this uh, uh, conference, the, according to data from Kulmanji's uh, Electricity Authority, we have 478 megawatt of hydropower produced by NEA compared to 441 megawatt produced by the private sector. So comparable. And we have 1,047 megawatt of electricity under construction from NEA compared to 2,044 from private sector. So on that front also, Nepal is doing quite well, but we need to do more. So these are the kind of uh, achievements Nepal has made in the past in terms of distributed generation, in terms of private sector participation in the power sector, which is very good. But now, there are some challenges. We talk a lot about foreign exchange risk. We talk a lot about the need for transmission lines. We talk a lot about the need for a new business model where private sector can participate. We also talk about the need to have a strong regulatory commission to come up soon to encourage private sector participation. In addition to that, there are a few overarching strategic issues that we need to take care of that I would like to dwell on. And those strategic issues are, one is climate and environmental risks, that is one. And the second one, I will elaborate further from the research results on what uh, Sujit said, domestic demand. And third one, I'll also give you some idea on, on the cross-border power trade front. First of all, you see, if you are a business person, because that is the perspective I was given as to put myself in, if you are a CEO of a company, and if you are looking at the business of establishing an energy company, you look at two things. You look at the cash flows that will come from the project in the future. And you also look at the risk that you will face because that will decide what your discount rate would be, what your cost of capital would be. From that point of view, when I say climate and environmental risks, what I'm suggesting is that the climate and environmental risks that a businessman faces, it increases the risk premium the investor has to ask for before investing in a hydropower project or a solar project. So what the government can do is to see how the government can help the private sector manage climate and environmental risks. Because this is a new kind of risk coming up from climate change. It wasn't there in the past. In the past, we talked about the production risk when you talk about hydropower project, construction, operations risk. We talk about the political risk. We talk about the currency risk. But we never talked much about climate change risk in the past. But now, the risk to the hydropower project, or in some extent also to the solar project, because of stream flow variability, because of the sediment load due to extreme events, because of the potential glacial liquid outplus plus, that is substantial. And when that kind of risk exists, when people like Dolma Foundation come to Nepal and they go around Europe seeking for funds, that, that is the question investors ask them. What is the level of climate risk this project is going to face? And to, to that end, Isimor has been doing some research and the results have been produced in the high map report. Like, for example, Eastmoot has done research on the Ganges Basin. And for two climate scenarios, they found out that during the summer, there will be increase in precipitation by about 10%. In the winter, there will be decrease in precipitation by about 10%. And Eastmoot also found out that there will be no significant seasonal change in the river flows for the next, till 2050. The contribution of snow melt and glacier melt will go down, but there will be increase in rainfall runoff 
As a result, there will not be a significant decline at an annual average level. And also, Isimor has estimated what are the, which ones of the glacial earth outburst flood potentials exist, are existing are shears. They have done that. And Isimor, of course, is interested to do more work on the sediment load also. These are the kind of research activities that Isimor is doing at the river basin level, and which Isimor is also partnering with Statcraft to do it at a catchment level that will help investors to assess how much risk is involved and how much return they should be asking for. And this is where the government can help, to manage these risks wherever possible. For example, to control potential gloves, to control sediment load wherever possible, or to do something about stream flow variability wherever possible. The second point I would like to uh, present to you is about this, the demand one that uh, Sujit already indicated. How much can we increase the demand by within the country, you see? Isimud did a study for a different purpose. Isimud was trying to find out how can we reduce the third lived climate pollutants in Nepal. And they did study that by 2030, if you increase the, by 50% electric water pumping in agriculture, if you increase by 37% intracity electric bus transportation, if you increase by 5% electric car transportation, and if you go full electric cooking in the urban areas, you can increase the demand by about three times by 2030. Now what that means is, another study that by USEID Sari says, the demand by 2030 per capita electricity consumption in Nepal probably will be around 366, if, things, if it is business as usual. If there's accelerated projects, then it will be 736. So even if we take 366 by 2030, what this would mean is per capita, electricity consumption could go up to around 1,100. So that is a level of demand we can increase, and that is a very important point for us to keep in mind. That how can we substitute electricity for other forms of energy in agriculture, in transportation, in households, and other in industry and other users, creating demand within Nepal. Now, on the, on the power trade, I agree a little bit with uh, Sujit, but I defer a little bit also. The reason why you need power trade is to improve the efficiency of the power system. In the sense, daily, if Nepal uses a lot of power in the evening, but that power doesn't get used during the day, Nepal is better off exporting that power to India during the rest of the day, during non-peak hours, as they call it. If Nepal has a lot of electricity during the summer, and if Nepal needs electricity during the winter, Nepal has to use that seasonal complementarity to trade with India. So from this point of view, the only way you can improve power sector efficiency in Nepal and take advantage of diurnal, daily, and seasonal complementarity is through power trade. So power trade is a must, but however, it is much better for Nepal to increase its own demand within the country and use go for clean energy rather than thinking of being rich by exporting electricity to India. But electricity is not an intermediate product. Electricity is a factor of production. It doesn't create much employment during generation and transmission. Although during construction, it does create some employment. So you have to use that electricity to build products and export those products, like Bhutan is doing. They build calcium carbide and export that calcium carbide to steel power plants in India. And that's the way to go. So the, my point is, power trade is important, but that is not the only solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. So please, uh, Gubind, it's your turn. OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, namaste to everyone. And thanks for uh, yes, yes, for inviting me and providing me this platform to say a few words. I will also join my colleague who were already highlighting uh, about different types of solution. But the main agenda today is mainstreaming renewable energy in Nepal. I think not, I'm not going beyond Nepal. So, uh, but we need to see that whether it is a mainstreaming electricity supply or mainstreaming energy supply. If you see the energy consumption scenario in Nepal, all, more than 60% of energy is consumed in cooking and heating. Because biomass supplies more than 75% of energy and domestic sector consumes more than 80%. So almost two thirds of energy that we are consuming is for cooking and heating, if you see the, that relation. 
So first, we need to see that which subsector and sector are consuming which types of energy. Because electricity meets only 5-6% of demand that, of energy that we are supplying now, or we are consuming now. So after looking in which sector, like the domestic heating and cooking sector consumes most of our energy uh, available in Nepal. So, and then transport sector, around 14-15%. Then other sectors are there. So then let's see which resource, let's do some resource mapping. Which are the resources that are renewable and we can mainstream our, in our energy supply system. One of the I mean, backbone of energy supply is hydropower. We know that. Hydropower may be just meeting the three, around 4 or 5% of energy demand at present. But it is the backbone of energy supply uh, of Nepalese uh, people in a longer term. But in short term, because we, we need to also have some social aspect for industrial, for urban consumer, electricity supplying or other renewable energy source is suitable. But if you go to the rural areas, because I call it pre-electrification, if you provide a 10 watt solar lamp to some community in Humla, they are already, then you can call them, they have access to electricity. But that is called pre-electrification, unless until you provide them sustained supply of modern energy, or long-term affordable energy. And that can be done by supplying a bigger system, whether it's a mini grid or um, a national grid. But we are happy that Nepal Electricity Authority is now having a plan to supply at least 733, uh, 55 centers in the country to reach so that they will extend grid up to that point. Then you can have local generation, like uh, maybe somewhere from solar, somewhere from wind, somewhere from micro hydro, mini hydro, so on, so that everyone can be connected to the national grid and they can fulfill their energy uh, need. But if you <coughs> see the, at present, Nepal is now, rural people are using like more than 400,000 rural people are using domestic biogas which is equivalent to almost two, more than 260 megawatt of thermal power. That is also renewable energy, and that has many other social advantages. Solar energy is isolated, small scale solar energy is now around 25 megawatt. And that are supplying electricity around 7% of Nepal's population. So altogether, off-grid solutions are providing electricity to around 17% of Nepal's population. And there are many benefits of those isolated and small off-grid solutions. But I call it pre-electrification because Kathmandu was electrified 100 years, more than 100 years ago, but few villages in Kalikot or Sunshari are still waiting for electricity. So to address also this uh, uh, social uh, disparity, you may need to go to the small-scale solution, which are maybe cheaper if you analyze in the uh, broader perspective. And that I call it pre-electrification because people then they will graduate in energy ladder and they will need more energy for washing machine, for cooking, and for transportation, for heating, cooling, and so on. That's why the first, uh, we need to see which type of resources. But then resources has also some limitation. Hydropower is backbone, but there are certain, uh, you need to have energy mix. If you want, we want to mainstream the energy supply in our system, there has to be some energy mix. Uh, for electricity, maybe 10 to 15 percent should come from other technologies. 80, around 80 to 90 percent hydropower, then 10 to 15 percent from other technologies because of the um, vulnerability uh, aspect, like earthquake, flood, many other issues are there. So, if you have a, uh, other technologies as well, so that you can make your energy supply system secure, not only renewable, but you need to have also sustained energy supply to the uh, consumer. That's why the then impacts. Uh, today I was looking some newspaper, and if you see the impact of climate change in hydropower, is going to be significant. Uh, Ramesh sir already highlighted that it's going to be significant. That's why the design of hydropower or other energy systems, if we want to rely on totally on renewable energy system, needs to be uh, these factors needs to be considered now, not in future. Because I know Kulman sir maybe he will highlight, there are so many IPPs are suffering because of hydrological risk. Our energy is not generated as they were expecting. Some percentage is less I heard from bank people. 
That's why these uh, mainstreaming renewable energy, we need to have a resource mapping. And where are the sector? Like the transportation sector, maybe personal car, you can have a electric, electric car, but heavy trucks still need more resource, more different types of other energy, maybe biofuel is required. Bioethanol is required for the uh, long-term transportation. So we need to have some sort of resource mapping and consumption sector. And what are the technologies available? Options are available. Uh, and if you see in the Nepal, we have limited options in resources as well. Transportation sector, biofuel is very limited. If you see at present, as per private sector's uh, information, you can fulfill 10%, maximum 10% of petrol consumed by Nepalese people at this point, by ethanol, and which can be easily mixed. So that is a very small percentage, because you cannot totally replace by ethanol your car. Uh, so gradually utilizing technologies based on different resources, and uh, developing technologies considering black carbon, climate, earthquake, landslide, and so on. So it, these, these, uh, to address these vulnerabilities, and the consumption pattern. Because now in kitchens, many people are using now electric appliances. People are also switching from gas to electric appliances. So the living standard also also changing. And that will change uh, your supply, energy supply pattern. Because people are more relying on the electrical energy than other energies. But it's still, it's still more than 60% energy is consumed by the domestic cooking and uh, light uh, heating sector. And if you consider the demography of Nepal, few more years, more than one decades will require to replace cooking fuel by other modern energy. That's why alternative energy promotion is promoting improved cookie stove, which will reduce the consumption of firewood. And that is a significant amount of energy if you calculate the uh, in energy units. That is also supplying huge amount of energy. Almost at 76% energy comes from biomass. That's why, in, in summary, let's, uh, if we want to mainstream the renewable energy supply system in our uh, context, let's see the sector, substructure sector where energy, are being, energy is being consumed, and what are the resources that can immediately replace those unsustainable uh, resources and mainstream the energy supply. Then develop long-term vision and long-term projects or technologies, <coughs> considering those uh, consequences, security, uh, climate change, black carbon, flood, earthquake, and so on. Only the, uh, if addressing this, then you can attract private sector, you can mobilize private sector, you can mobilize government money, then only we can uh, mainstream our energy supply. I think these are the main issues. Many people are neglecting climate factor, and which is alarming, actually. If we see, if modelings are okay, I don't know, because I'm not the modeler, but if we see the modeling models that are being developed by many climate scientists, there are, uh, uh, I mean, alarming scenario for Nepal. So thank you. Thank you very much. I've been a modeler in my past, the climate scientist. So maybe that's also something to talk about. Uh, so thank you very much. I hand over to Kurman. Looking forward to your remarks. Thank you. <laughs> While talking about uh, clean energy, I think uh, we have to see how we are consuming energy in our total consumption level. I think uh, it has already been iterated uh, that uh, if around 80% of uh, energy is from biomass <clears throat> and only 3% is from electricity we are now utilizing. And remaining, I, I think, almost these fossil fuels. So I think uh, this 3% uh, of electricity is clean energy. We are already in clean energy. This hydropower must be the clean energy. And renewable energies, I think uh, solar and other uh, wind, they are also contributing to coming to our grid system. So clean energy, promoting clean energy means increase the consumption level of uh, electricity, how we can increase the percentage of electricity utilization in our 
consumer level. So that means you have to <clears throat> intervene for transportation sector and cooking and heating, heating and cooling system. We have to use, increase the utilization of electricity. So this is very important aspect. How can we make use of this uh, electric vehicle and uh, induction heaters with the electricity utilization? That is very important. And as it has been already said that the per capita consumption of electricity is very low, 165 unit per capita. If we go for 1,000 unit per capita, a huge demand will be there. So only the consumption of domestic consumption or industrial consumption uh, will not uh, make the energy utilization clean. We have to go for further other sectors, transportation, agriculture, and uh, this cooking and heating system. So I think uh, in our generation mix, hydropower is the dominant factor. Some import is there. I think this import, I cannot say clean energy. By next year or two years, uh, that will be that, that will be replaced by our hydropower generation because by next two years, we are adding around 1,000 megawatt of hydropower. So today we have, we have 1,000 megawatt of generation. So next 1,000 megawatt, and within three years, we are going to have next five year, five, 500 megawatt. So around 2,500 megawatts of generation will be there. So this will make our system <coughs> more cleaner. So I think uh, uh, generation in generation mix, we have already uh, issued policies policies for solar power also solar energy. Uh, that uh, we have net metering policies. We can have rooftop solars. We can have any type of solar that that can be sent to grid and you can utilize in the daytime and you can send to grid and that can be net metered. Our net payment system is also, also going to be introduced. Another aspect is for clean energy, <coughs> the energy efficiency part is very important. So energy efficiency in Nepal is uh, the most neglected part. So if we go for energy efficiency in every <clears throat> household and industrial area and uh, solar system in rooftop areas, then every house can be the powerhouse. Every house, because if every house generates, it's the lesser the generation saving of the electricity is also the generation of electricity. So this can be the another source of making the our system cleaner. So this is very important. And distributed generation, regarding distributed generation, <clears throat> our system, our power plants are already distributed, distributed all over Nepal. We have around 100 powerhouse. And we have already signed PPA with around uh, 300 uh, projects. That means these powerhouse are already in distributed areas. And these powerhouse will give the, uh, the local areas supply. So these are the distributed generation that will give uh, a solution to, to the local area. So already we have distributed system. So solar, solar and wind, we, are, we have already allocated 10 to 15% of uh, generation mix. And from our system itself, we are already uh, executing uh, uh, 25 megawatt of solar. And solar PPA is underway. And there are so many uh, bidding coming, uh, coming up for solar uh, PPA. Uh, there are certain uh, mismatches or certain issues with uh, solar PPA regarding this uh, price uh, falling down and uh, the international price and uh, the price issued by government of Nepal. So, but uh, ultimately, we are going forward with uh, clean energy. Nepal will be cleaner. I think we are, <laughs> we used to say that Nepal will be the battery bank to the region 
not only Nepal, but uh, to the South Asian region. Thank you. Thank you very much.